the marvels. That's it? That's the best you got? So last week I said that the MCU was beginning a downward spiral and it looked like the Marvels was only the beginning of the trouble ahead. Well, I saw the Marvels a few days later and it did indeed suck. Oh, that sucks. Nia DaCosta made a pretty engaging spin on Candyman and she's pretty much admitted that Kevin Feige commandeers these movies at a certain point, so it's no fault on her part, but really, this amalgamation of two streaming shows and a once billion dollar sub-franchise simply didn't have the chops to keep my interest. The power switching gimmick ended up coming across as nonsense, with fuzzy rules thanks to some less than stellar editing, and it feels like it basically becomes an afterthought after the first action sequence. Nick Fury feels like he was pulled from a point in time pre-secret invasion, but somehow this is post that lame ass streaming series. Well, at least Nick is looking rejuvenated. Happy for him. Strong theory. The movie feels like it skipped over what would have been a true Captain Marvel sequel. We just jump right past the setup at the end of the first movie, and Jude Law, I guess Jude Law was too busy working on Disney's other ailing franchise. Don't beat me with that. Believe the anti-hype, this villain is just as one note and disappointing as everyone is saying, and there's really no excuse to have antagonists be this one dimensional 10 years on from Malekith. And you can look out the window. When you look at the world through a window, it makes it awesome, like TV. Of course you've got your usual culture war camps engulfing the reaction to this movie. You can't have a Marvel movie disappoint anymore without someone positing it's because of rampant racism, sexism, etc. Or that the audience gleefully wants these things to fail and are simply nasty little haters. I'm aware that there is bigotry in some of these fandoms, but I think tarnishing everyone with the same brush merely because they dislike a movie is in bad faith. It's often a malaise of factors that lead to these movies getting poorly received. Honestly, it feels like you could champion people of colour and women in these movies, both on screen and behind the camera, and then, you know, you say one of these Marvel movies isn't very good, well... <laughs> Why don't you go join the rest of the fucking Nazis? It is much easier to say something like Thor Love and Thunder is trash, because there's no way anybody can link your dislike of the movie to bigotry in an attempt to destabilise any negative reaction or garner attention on their social media platform of choice. As per usual, all these outlandish takes and reactions come down to marketing. It is much better for your platform to grow if you say something really outlandish. It is exhausting! And just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, Loki Season 2 rolls around and somehow sucks even more than the Marvels. This is the worst MCU thingy Loki has ever been a part of. Just front to back, this series... <laughs> Oh god, I can feel your anger rushing to the comment section as we speak. Well, yeah, psych nav. Uh, of course I don't think that. Unlike a whole host of recent Marvel releases, this feels like some forethought was paid to the story and the characters and making you feel something, as well as giving us resolutions and arcs. What a concept. What a concept. The series kept the focus firmly on being a character study of Loki. Everyone here knows what you're doing, you know. You're just trying to make up for all the awful shit you've done in your life, you pathetic little man. Even though he's set on a path to redemption, he still has to contend with the horrible things he's done and the misguided idea of his glorious purpose. Mobius telling him that purpose is more burden than glory was a fantastic way to send him hurtling towards his final god Loki form, doing something utterly selfless yet completely isolating and punishing. Loki doesn't want to be alone, but is willing to do so for all eternity just to save his friends and give everyone a chance. Tom Hiddleston's ad-lib in the final episode calls back to his first appearance, and alongside the Avengers' glorious purpose callback, this whole ending feels so attuned to everything we've seen from the character since 2011. I know what kind of god I need to be for you, for all of us. And how cool is it that Mobius and Loki's first conversation are also their last? Time travel! These two have been the beating heart of the series. How many characters in the MCU have gotten the chance to sit down with some pie and talk about an existential crisis? Get me a big bowl of pie, some ice cream on it. Mmm, good. I'm really going to miss this character. He's been one of the best post-Endgame additions. The entire cast was so strong, building upon the foundations of Season 1, with everyone from KC to B15 getting satisfying endings. Seeing the TVA ponder their lives outside of those work walls brought to mind Severance in flattering ways. 
That being said, Kei Hu Kwan's OB really stole the show. His character was an utter delight, hilarious and heartwarming in equal measure. Sylvie felt a little sidelined this time around, and you could definitely feel Marvel downplaying the romance angle. I think that's a shame, because they already made it such an integral part of the story. I think it's melodramatic to call it self cessed it's bloody sci-fi, they're not really the same person are they, like really. Sylvie is her own character, but whatever, what she did get to do was good. Eric Martin was bumped up to head writer of series 2 and that ended up being a great move. In an interview with Script Magazine, he outlined his priorities, stating that the first layer of work is just character, character, character. I lay all of that down where I think of who they really are right now, what they want, what they think they want, and what they really want. What starts to feel juicy in that? What starts to feel meaty and meaningful? This adherence to getting emotionally involved with the characters and feeling out their desires and deeper meanings is why this show has stood head and shoulders above so much theme park superhero fare released in the last few years. Directors Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead are a directing duo I've admired for almost a decade now, starting with 2014 feature Spring. They're compelling sci-fi tales ranging from The Endless to Synchronic starring the MCU's own Anthony Mackie to Something in the Dirt meant they were perfect for Loki. Alongside directors Daniel Delu and Kasra Farahani, they ensured this season is the MCU's best looking show by a mile. It feels like a bare minimum requirement, but I was so happy to watch an MCU project where I have the constant confidence that the film making deployed is going to pull me on the story in the most engrossing and engaging way possible. Some particular highlights include Sylvie's record shop scene, seeing the TVA slowly get compacted in a brilliantly horrific scene, and Loki using all manner of powers to halt X5. This was cold. It's also nice to see Loki at the height of his powers, following classic Loki's suggestion to ditch the knives. It's great to see him use his telekinesis more often, and all manner of magic spells. Of course the direction and cinematography is bolstered by the best production design the MCU has ever had, which is also thanks to Kasra Farahani. The TVA, He Who Remains Palace at the End of Time, even the retro McDonald's, it all looks flawless. Look how far goodwill for the MCU goes when you put honest to god effort into proceedings. Overall I think I preferred the first season if only because it felt more fresh and that's when the most change occurred for the Loki character. This season felt more of an extended epilogue to that first series, but it ends on a really strong note and I feel like at some point I'd actually love to dive in and binge all 12 episodes. With this season I think Loki has edged back out over WandaVision as my favourite Disney Plus Marvel show, but that's not to say WandaVision isn't still very enjoyable. I'd say the key thing both of these shows got right where the others largely got it wrong is that they really feel like they could only be told in this medium. These shows feel like television, they don't play out like six part four and a half hour movies with huge sagging issues in the middle. I found the time loom story thread, no pun intended, a bit too obtuse to be engaging early on, but I was still invested in the show because of the characters and their personal journeys. And then, hey, what do you know, the time loom stuff actually came together and ended up quite involving by the final episode when things took an edge of tomorrow turn and Loki was forced to repeat proceedings over and over until he got it right. Time Loom, I've come to bargain. Which also reminds me, I got some flack in the past for saying Loki was like Doctor Who, a really rather tepid, apolitical thing to say that somehow still brought the ear of sensitive Who fans, and yet, after another season, I'm sorry, the bloody Doctor Who references are right there. Every time Loki and Mobius go on another little duo time hop to somewhere weird and wonderful, you can feel the Who. When Loki lives through centuries trying to fix the loom, I couldn't help but think of the Doctor's tenacity in Heaven Sent, two gods forced to relive the same moments using only their ingenuity to beat eternity. Watching Loki prune himself felt like the kind of twist Moffat would have enacted had he been writing The God of Mischief himself. The time trips were the most fun this season had, seeing X5 aka Brad Wolf try and outrun Loki's magic in a brilliantly directed London set 70s chase was great, as was Victor Timely's antics in the third episode. It felt like every chapter was jam packed and made full use of its runtime, something that was also present in the first season and rarely present in these six part Marvel streaming shows. What most impressed me about Loki Season 2 was partially the thing that was putting me off in the first place. After a wonky introduction to Kang in Quantumania, and a Season 1 finale that was more set up than payoff, I wasn't that jazzed to see such a good MCU show get so caught up in the multiverse saga. But when the twist comes that He Who Remains wanted all this to happen, just so that he would not in fact die, only for Loki to end up taking his place and instigating a TVA that will hunt his variants, well, it all came full circle. 
With all the rumours of Kang being replaced by a different overarching big bad for Secret Wars and the Blank Dynasty, it retroactively feels like He Who Remains was the premier Kang. I feel like the MCU has faced him now, he's been the nemesis for Loki, and it feels fitting. The first big villain for the Avengers, the once disciple of Thanos, is instrumental in taking down Thanos' replacement. Old Big Bad meet New Big Bad. By New Big Bad. Sure, it seems like we could see more Kang variants in the future, but I think the idea that the TVA's main objective is now hunting them wraps that up if you need. I'm satiated by the Loki vs Kang narrative in both of these seasons, and the God of Stories 1, banishing he who remains to his fate at the hands of Sylvie, and ensuring no other universe will face the Conqueror. If he never shows up again, I don't think it will be the dangling thread everyone thought it would be. On that note, it really reminds me of when the Doctor used post-hypnotic suggestion to get humanity to drive the silence off their planet in Day of the Moon. We never actually saw the ongoing result of that, just knowing that that was the new status quo was enough. So I think leaving the TVA in the capable hands of Loki's cast to halt the plans of any Kang that ever was, or ever will be, is showing more than enough. I said all the way back in January that it would have been bittersweet if Thor and Loki tragically fell just short of a reunion, all thanks to Kang and his dastardly ways. But since it seems like nothing anywhere near close to that scenario is going to happen, then why not entertain the idea that they would indeed reunite? If Chris Hemsworth is looking to retire the character of Thor, and Tom Hiddleston thinks that this could be the twilight phase of Loki, then why not give them a true to hand a buddy movie grand finale? Loki has now been a title character, so don't relegate his name. Call their final adventure Thor and Loki. Rather than the movie setting up any kind of further multiversal shenanigans or future MCU movies, pull a Guardians 3 and make it a self-contained wrap-up for these characters and these characters only. I think if the MCU wants to continue, then it needs to focus on endings. Nobody is enthusiastic about RDJ and ScarJo coming back into the fold after their characters got such definitive endings, but I'd put good money on audiences getting excited for a Thor and Loki story done right. Just the prospect of reuniting the pair after everything they've been through is worth the price of admission alone. And both characters have a sizable cast of supporting characters that would work well together. Kang and Mobius, Sylvie and Valkyrie, OB and Eric Selvig. Simply put, Loki has been a triumph. Whilst the MCU flails around for its Fantastic Four cast or subtracts movies from its ever-changing schedule, it's nice to know there will still be projects like Loki that can get you invested, entertain you and make you feel something. Because God knows, it's been a while since the MCU has given us that. Next up, what if? I think I might just put a video out a day over the Christmas period and review all of these as they come. A big thank you to my full fat tier patron, Dr. Chike and Nathan Shaw. If you'd like to donate money to my Patreon, you can find me at patreon.com slash fullfatvideos. If you'd like to find me on Instagram, you can find me at full underscore fat underscore videos. And if you'd like to find me on Twitter, you can find me at, at fullfatvideos.